How's it going, folks? I'm Matt, and this is Photo Syntech. Welcome to another episode of Meet the Industry. Today, I have a very special episode, guys. I have David Olson and Tyler Platt here to talk about Concentrated Biology Products, a newer product that they've brought online here the last little while. It's a micro product. It does wonderful things for your garden, and we're going to learn all about microbiology today. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, great to be here, Matt. Thanks. So, yeah, thanks for having us on. And I'm just super stoked to have you here. Uh, now, just before we get going, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, guys, if you are new to the channel and you've seen some of my other gardening stuff, all the products that we talk about here are directly applicable to that type of gardening. However, to stay within YouTube community guidelines, we aren't going to be talking about that kind of stuff at all. And also, if you don't like seeing the ads that are on this video, I encourage you to use an ad blocker. But if you'd like to support me, head on over to patreon.com slash photosyntech. Link is in the comments, and you can see how you want to support this uh, channel on a monthly basis. With that being said, push that stuff aside. Guys, let's talk micros. All right. So I want to dive in deep and, and do a bunch of learning here. But before we do that, I'd like to know a little bit more about how the concentrated biology came to be, how you two started working together. What's what's the history there? And well, I'd like to say, uh, luckily, we have uh, Rich, the owner of Grassroots. He is just an, an expert with um, just finding things. And um, for the longest time, you know, um, we can bring great containers to people and great products, but if they don't have great soil or great biology, they can't get to where some of our other customers have gotten and the success that they've had. So for, for years, we looked around at how can we provide people with the biology or with the soil and, and, and soils, it's, it's, it's hard to ship. It's very expensive to ship and you're better off buying, buying somebody local to you. So yeah. how can we find a way to provide, you know, life, for this soil, life for these products, and also food for these products. Because a lot of these manufacturers of microbes out there give you just the microbes. They don't give you the food sources that they use when they manufacture the products. So, you know, we, we have um, very diverse micro foods that Dave's gonna go deep into today um, that we've designed to create diversity and we've designed to create fixes for other issues. And we've designed to boost certain elements that you may need and dial things in. So um, I personally have been using it for a few years to kind of uh, kind of vet it and bring it out to other growers and stuff like that and people that I know. And it's shown nothing but success. And um, we're really happy about the price points we can bring it out at for people and the concentration of everything. So um, we're just really lucky. He's so close to us too. And um you know, the conversations we have about microbes, I'm just so glad we can get these behind camera and out so people can can see them because we have these amazing conversations and my mind blows every time I get in the room with this guy. So, you know, and we never cover the same thing once, which is, or, you know, it's like you can't, can't repeat the same conversation the same way. So we always find more out of that. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> Something about agriculture is there's so many factors. Oh, oh, very much. And once you start going down that rabbit hole, it's it's just more to learn, more to learn, more to learn. And every time, of course, you uncover a new leaf, there's something else. Yeah. So let's let's get into the soil. Let's let's talk about microbes. Of course, they are the real workers in the system. You may have things like worms, rove beetles, other types of life in there. But of mm -hmm. course, not all are created equal. Can you tell us about the specific types of microbial life that we'd like to have in the soil? and what the individual benefits to the plants are. Sure, well, there's, there's several different ways to approach categorizing microbes. So there are ones that require uh, oxygen as part of their respiration, so those are aerobes. Uh, soils can go anaerobic, which means that the metabolism of the microbes are using anything, not, not using oxygen. And so that, that's a big differentiator because some microbes have to have oxygen, so they're aerobic obligates. Uh, some are facultative, meaning they can be either one or the other, or some are strictly anaerobic. And the metabolism that you get out of anaerobes tends to produce metabolites, uh, things like uh, ethane, methane, alcohol, glycol, uh, aldehyde, formaldehyde, uh, uh, there's, yeah, there's, there's quite a few, yeah, uh, sulfus type compounds. Uh, most of those are actually toxic to plants. 
So we want to avoid anaerobic uh, soil. So there's a big differentiator. And even the, the facultative microbes, they'll change their metabolism depending on whether they have oxygen to work with or not. So what could be a good guy microbe uh, in an aerobic condition can actually be detrimental type um, microbe under anaerobic conditions because it changes what it's eating and what it's doing. So that, that's kind of one basic characterization. Then, then you've got your you know, taxonomy. So you've got protozoa, which are things like ciliates, flagellates, uh, amoeba. Those are kind of the, the recyclers. So they consume all the dead, dead microbes. And as they do that, they're releasing nutrients uh, that they, they can't absorb themselves. And those are actually in plant available form. So the, they're really an important part of the soil uh, life cycle as well as nutrient cycle. Uh, then there, of course you have bacteria closely related to that or subcategory archaea. Uh, then you've got fungi and yeast. Uh, so there's, there's tons of different uh, categories of things like that. Um, let's see, bacteria, uh, under bacteria, you have gram positive and gram negative. That just refers to uh, the, the structure of the shell around the microbe. Okay. okay. And, and uh, so the, the gram positive has basically a two, two levels of shell. The gram negative tense is more of a primitive structure, so it's only got one layer. Uh, what's interesting to differentiate that is most of the bacterial infections that we get in, in crops, uh, in canopies in crops, are all gram negative bacteria. So uh, you've got things like uh, Xanthomonas albicola, uh, Pseudomonas syringae. Those, those are two very broad spectrum type of bacterial uh, canopy pests. Uh, that are gram negative. And, and if you look at the list of all of them, the, by far the majority of them are, are gram negative, which is, which is an interesting attribute because there are some microbes that specialize in consuming gram negative bacteria. So if you're thoughtful about you know, what products you're using or uh, how you're using them, you can actually kind of direct the biology to, to address those kinds of uh, canopy problems. Interesting, interesting. So I guess these different types of bacteria, it's, it's, it's really about having that level of diversity in the soil and having things that have the ability to change uh, depending on the conditions in a positive way. Now, when you want to bring in the microbiology to the soil, uh, there's natural ways to do this. I've been looking into things like Korean natural farming, for example, and the practice there with indigenous microorganism harvesting. Now, I find this to be a very interesting practice, the idea of taking rice and leaving it somewhere in the forest, for example, to yeah. capture all of this biology. And the idea there is to bring in both the good and bad. Now, what are your thoughts on this sort of process, David? Is it is it a good way to do it? How do you go about capturing microbial life? We've captured a lot of biology, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you that's, know, that's 20, true. 20, 20, 30 different locations for our current product. That we're pretty yeah, we do collect microbes kind of from all over the world in diff different uh, situations because we know that under a certain set of conditions, it will tend to propagate a, a population of microbes that has, say, a functional characteristic we're, we're interested in capturing and propagating. And I, I, I am very interested in, in the free and natural farming, although it's not something I, I claim to really know a lot about. With regards to capturing a wild culture, that actually is, that's, that's very uh, consistent with kind of our philosophy and approach where what we're looking to do is, is establish maximum uh, diversity of the population. And uh, so as many different genus uh, as, as we can get in there, um, what we see is um, the microbes will actually change behavior based off of their population density. Uh, that is within a, a particular genus and species, you can have a microbe that is either benign or even beneficial at low population levels. Whereas if it gets to very large or dominant and, and uncontested uh, population uh, levels, it becomes pathogenic. So a good example of that would be a fungus called a Fusarium oxysporum. So it's a, um, it's a very common little seedling disease yeah. and it goes from nothing to dead plants almost overnight. 
uh, and, and that's an example of why it's so important to have that diversity is if you've got all these checks and balances of microbes that are competing for food and habitat and you know, have predator prey type relationships, those things stay in balance. So you might say that you know, collecting a wild culture, you might have some microbes in there that have the potential for, for being bad actors, but as long as they're in balance, they won't be. So uh, we, we try to be very, very careful about where we collect our cultures, but um, you know, wild, collecting wild cultures is, is as old as microbiology itself. Very interesting. So speak a little bit more to the process on how you determine what sort of location that you'd want to uh, take microbes from and what the criteria are in collection. Sure. Well, I guess it, it gets to maybe one of your leading questions at the beginning of the program, which was, what are the beneficial functions of the microbes? So there's quite a, quite a number of different beneficial functions. So we're looking for a, a location and a, set, a combination of conditions that kind of in situ has forced a population to adapt to a particular set of conditions. So I'll, I'll give an example. Um, we have a, a culture of microbes that are particularly oriented towards consuming chitin. Chitin is an organic molecule that's a kind of a structural building block in nature. So it's things like exoskeletons of, of insects. It's also you know, crab and lobster shell and shrimp shell. Uh, but it's also the exterior sheath bundle on a lot of the pathogenic fungi. Uh, so if you have microbes that are naturally able to produce this enzyme to break down that material, it's a good way to keep those prop populations in balance, keep everybody paving right. So uh, in that case, uh, I collected some samples uh, kind of out by the outfall of a uh, food processor or a seafood processor. Okay. okay. So, you know, we knew that it's like for 50 years, they've been dumping, you know, crab shells and shrimp shells here. And it's like, well, those microbes are going to be really well tuned up to, to chew on these. Oh, absolutely. No, it makes a ton of sense. And, and tidal med flats and things like that. Or uh, we have an, another function that's a beneficial function of microbes is for them to solubilize uh, cations, uh, minerals that are. Uh, not available to the plant until a micro processes them. So cations are things like magnesium, manganese, calcium, potassium, copper, zinc, uh, manganese. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so the microbes have the, the capability of, of doing that function, which is really important because you could have lots of those minerals in the soil, but if the microbes aren't there to process it, a plant can be sitting in the middle of it and still be deficient. Absolutely. So in the case of looking for a microbe that's a, a good cytophore, that's the term for that function. Uh, cytophore means iron carrier. So if I'm looking for a microbe that's good at doing that with iron, which is a cation, um, I looked at a, uh, a rock outcropping where there was a very, very high concentration of iron is kind of up in, in the gold country. And so I knew that there would be a lot of microbes there that are, are capable of reducing iron. Very interesting, very interesting. So I'm looking to get into collecting some of my own microorganisms. Yep. Would there be a place that I would want to stay away from where I may get more of the bad than the good? Yeah, I would tend to stay from uh, stay away from highly disturbed areas. You know, so something that's just been really intensively farmed the biology tends to be really thin, you know, that, that a good healthy soil should have a billion microbes in it and thousands of species, or at, at the very least hundreds of species. Um, and if you go to like a really intensively commercially farmed uh, soil, well, oftentimes we'll find 10% or even a, a millionth of what a healthy population would be. So that's not something you would want to propagate off of because all you're gonna, you know, when you start feeding it, you're going to get more of whatever was there. And what, what was there was really an in, incomplete food web and something that was, it would naturally come out of balance. So undisturbed soils, you know, I love forest soils. Uh, we have some little uh, corners of the Delta where, where our, our properties are. Uh, I land that I know hasn't been disturbed for probably close to a hundred years. 
And so it's, it's just had a natural opportunity to you know, establish a complete biology. Now, one, one thing that it's almost kind of an axiom or, or uh, just, just something that, that's talked about occasionally is in a virgin field, so a, a piece of ground that's never been farmed before, the very first crop you put on it actually has the highest yields and the best quality and the least production problems of pests and diseases that you'll ever get off that piece of ground. And I remember hearing that as a kid and I was like, why would that be? What happens to the soil? Uh, well, uh, in an undisturbed soil, you of course have well-defined horizons uh, in the soil. So you've got you know, the crop, the residue of, of the native plants on the top and then kind of layers of humus you know, all the way down to uh, parent material. Well, the first thing we do is we disc it up <laughs> And we bed it up, and so we've we've flipped over all those horizons, and you know, throughout all those layers, there's different sets of biology. So we've we've kind of immediately upset it and started to lose that diversity, uh, and the population size as well. So actually, kind of our mission statement as a micro product manufacturer is to restore that population and that diversity and the, and all those functions. That is honorable work. Absolutely. And, you know, I just I applaud you guys on what you're doing. To touch off that, though, how do you manufacture microbes? Well, it's it's pretty straightforward if you are just paying attention to what all the building blocks of life are. Okay. So, uh, you know, you need to have the right quantity and ratio of different nutrients. So obviously carbon being, you know, the most fundamental building block of life. Uh, but then we've got, uh, you know, our, our major nutrients in nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium, and then our minor, minor nutrients, sulfur and, and calcium, uh, magnesium kind of being the next tier of ones, and then all, all the different little micronutrients. So, you know, all the way across, you know, practically two thirds of the way across the periodic table. Uh, and then, and you have to have energy sources. So the ability to break those materials down, um, and then, of, of course, vitamins, uh, different things that microbes use for different en enzymatic processes. Um, uh, yeah, so you've got your amino acids, which are part of your nitrogens, uh, but there's a, quite a, a number of different amino acids. You know, commonly, they talk about 23, but there's way more than that. And so that's something that we pay a lot of attention to because not all microbes can use, say, every one of the different types of amino acids. So in our approach, we're looking for maximum diversity. Makes so sense. we're we're feeding them different protein sources and being very uh, thoughtful about the the covering covering off a of large spectrum of the different types of amino acids, and then the forms of all the different materials as well. Uh, you can have synthetic inputs, which are materials that are already in kind of plant available form, that kind of really cuts the microbe out of the process. Uh, so we feed the microbes forms of materials that they have to work for, because that's our way to actually turn on the gene sequence of those microbes that have that capability to do that function. So as an example, uh, there's phosphate solubilizing uh, microbes. Uh, microbes only do functions that they're kind of being rewarded for. If there's an abundance of something there already that they don't have to work for, they won't do that function. Uh, and microbes have lots of different functions and they don't have them all turned on all, of them, all, of, all at once. So we can manipulate their environment through or manipulate their gene expression, uh, their active uh, functions by manipulating the food that we give them and the habitat that we create. So the pH of the water, the bicarbonate load of the water uh, or lack thereof, uh, the level of aeration, the pH uh, temperature, uh, we manipulate the metabolic pathways of that the microbes can use by having either things that encourage a particular uh, set of enzyme functions or actually uh, cut it off. So as an example, we use a urease inhibitor uh, in some products. So it's, it's really all about paying attention to all the building blocks for the, for the biology. 
I, I think that makes total sense in that you're preparing a perfect environment for them to live in and thrive, which is what we're trying to do for our plants. But when it comes time to harvest, how, how do you get the microbes out of the environment? Uh, well, let's see. So we do, we collect cultures like we talked about a little bit, uh, and then we create kind of a mother culture for different products. Uh, so we have products that are oriented towards maximum diversity. We have ones that are oriented towards consuming the chitin that I mentioned, another product that's oriented towards consuming uh, blue cans, another structural building block. Uh, we have another culture that uh, we're really focusing the microbe population on all the fertilizer related functions. So fixing nitrogen, solubilizing phosphorus, uh, the cytophore function of chelating all the cations, uh, that, that sort of function. And then we also have a culture that we've, that we are propagating that uh, is specifically dedicated to breaking down cellulose and lignin. That's, that's for breaking down crop residues and things like that. In a super luscious field on a beautiful organic farm, and the farmer said, you can take a sample of this amazing soil. Would you just take some, collect it, and then bring it back? Yeah, yep. And then we might, uh, we would probably run that through metagenomics, uh, which is uh, which is a uh, commercial test that we use, where they will take a small sample of soil, or they can actually also process some plant tissue, and they will strip all the DNA out of all the, the microbes. And so you've got these long DNA strands and they have a DNA reader. And so it reads the entire DNA sequence of the microbe. Then it'll match it to a database and say, ah, we recognize this sequence. That's this particular microbe. So, yeah, and from there, once we've identified what, what genus and species that microbe is, we, can, we look up what the functions are that have been documented for it. And then we can see, okay, well, this is a population that we would like to add to our collection or to, to propagate, or perhaps it has uh, detrimental species that we're like, nope, this is not, not going in there. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's talk about the products themselves, the concentrated biology products. Break down, and you kind of touched on that a little bit, uh, what the different functions are, but break down the different products for me and what I would want to use and when. Sure. Well, in, in general, so our base product, uh, microbial inoculant, is called Metagro ST. And ST just stands for stable. So all of our micro products uh, are shelf stable. So you can keep them for a year, uh, plus with, with no loss in the population nor the function of the, of the product. Uh, that's kind of an important differentiator for us compared to most other, many other microbial products. Um, and then this, this product is the one that we've designed for the absolute maximum uh, diversity. So we have over 20,000 species of microbes represented in this. So, and uh, the other thing uh, is, and this gets back to, I think the, one of your original questions was about concentrated biology. Uh, the way we do this process, we end up with enormous populations. So it's a six stage process of, of building and curating the, this population over about a three week period of time, we get a new generation of microbes about every 20 minutes. And so we end up with populations over 100 billion uh, per milliliter. Or uh, one of our last uh, assays from metagenomics was over a trillion microbes per milliliter. So that's one times 10 to the 12th. So if you compare that to a lot of other biological products, you might see an exponent where it says one times 10 to the uh, fifth. So that's uh, 100,000. Okay, so you can subtract exponents. So if we have to the 12th, somebody has to the fifth, um, that you can subtract it. So that means that we have one times 10 to the seventh more microbes than that other product. Well, to the seventh, that's 10, 10 million times more microbes for every one microbe they have, we have 10 million. Or for every gallon of our product you put on per acre, you would have to put on 10 million <laughs> of theirs. That's, that's least, the concentrated part. <laughs> yeah, and that is the concentrated part because it's a numbers game. You know, when we talked, you know, at the beginning about how many microbes there are, you know, 
a billion or so in a gram of soil. Think about you know, an, an acre of soil uh, at, at the volume that the plants use the, the soil. I mean, that's you know, an unbelievable you know, high number of grams times a billion microbes. So it's a numbers game. You know, so if you have a product, you know, and there's many products out there that are one times 10 to the fourth, uh, you know, so you've got 10,000 microbes uh, of a particular species. You're, it's, you're just not putting on enough to make any kind of difference at all. And then my other problem with those, those products is, you know, they tend to be just a handful of select species. And our, you know, we've, we've got a, a long experience with this and what happens with those is it's a very hit and miss performance. So under some circumstances, you apply that, those selected species and it's like, yeah, they really catch a foothold and they start doing their function and you see the benefit. But you might also like literally on the other side of the fence line on, an, on the next field over the same product, you won't see anything at all. And, you know, that, that's just kind of unacceptable in a you know, commercial and economic uh, context. You know, you have to have reliable outcome. Uh, and that's what happens with those products that just are so few species. So sometimes they'll work, sometimes they won't. And that's a little frustrating. So very, we, very we went to this broad biology approach where we know that no matter what the set of conditions are, we have a very, very high rate of colonization. So uh, we do things like do the metagenomics testing on the soil before a treatment. And we've done the metagenomics testing on our own products, so we know exactly what species and concentrations are in there. And then we do metagenomics on the soil after the treatment, a few weeks after. And we can actually see exactly which species, you know, genus and species of our product has successfully colonized in that soil. So one of our recent tests uh, was like 73% of the species that were in our product were after the, the treatment detected in the soil. What would be considered a normal number then? Uh, for like a micro product or? Well, just to get that, that uptake, uh, the colonization rate, if you're hitting 73%, is that uh, above average? Is that around typical? What would you expect? I, I would say that's got to be substantially higher than, than normal. It, it would depend okay. on the type of product that I, I think you're talking about. And, and for those products that are just a handful of different species, it's going to be very situational. So sense. You, you might get lucky and, and have a good scenario where maybe you did have 73%, you know, 75% colonization. Uh, but you might, again, on the other side of the fence line, have 5%. So, you know, you really kind of wasted your time and, and money in that case. And, and not, not, all, not all species colonize all at once. There's microbes that are good early colonizers, and they kind of pave the way for the other ones. Uh, so if, if conditions are unfavorable, really there's, you know, the, the species that are well adapted to that. So say there's a pH problem or cation base saturation or something like that, um, or alkalinity or, or something like that, the, um, uh, salinity, uh, the certain species will colonize those effectively at the beginning. And if you reintroduce that same population again, there will be kind of a successive wave of colonization. So more and more of them come in. So uh, interestingly, th this is not the way I, I kind of thought of it at the beginning, but I, I, we've seen it enough to, to have some observations now that the bacteria tend to be actually the good early colonizers. So you've probably heard of bacilli and things like that. So bacillus okay. species tend to actually be pretty good, uh, actually excellent early colonizers. And some of the fungal populations uh, really having to have a reasonably well-established set of biology before they're successful at colonizing. So as an example, one, one uh, fungi that a lot of people are familiar with are mycorrhizae. Yep. They are late colonizers. So really? if you have a sterile soil and you're putting in, uh, you know, mycorrhizae, the colonization rate is terrible. And so if you combine the mycorrhizae with say our Metagro ST product, which has this you know, very, very large and diverse population, the colonization is much, much more successful for mycorrhizae. 
I think that, uh, that that would be a fair point too, because I know that mycorrhizae requires a fair amount of uh, well, plant life and stuff too to attach to as well. So I think that, yeah, a very, very interesting point. Now, I just wanted to touch back on something. Uh, you said that throughout the life that you're going to get different colonization rates and different um, bacteria will take hold. Is that then what would make sense with doing repeat applications of said product on a regular basis? And then to that point, if I'm also using a different product, would I have a concern? Are they not going to play nicely together? Would there be something that I would want to avoid? It goes into the Metagrow ST we have, which is the opposite of the original. Uh, Metagrow ST is for overall diversity. And we have Metagrow ST3, which is fed to chitin food. And that is to fix problems in the soil and we have issues. And that product we recommend to do once a week for four weeks um, to kind of fix those issues and then switch back to normal ST to really get back into that diversity. Work for also resetting soils as well. Um, but yeah, I'll let you. Yeah. Your, your question, uh, actually I do like rotating products. Uh, but once, you know, once you really, so successive, introductions of the microbes is a very good approach to do it with. Uh, one thing that makes our product different than most other microbial products is because we grow out the culture for so long, we actually build up a large amount of metabolite uh, in the product. So metabolites are the byproducts of the, the microbes uh, consumption of food. And these are things that materials that directly act on the plant. So uh, plant growth regulators uh, and and different uh, enzymes that the, the plants can actually utilize. And so there's kind of an immediate effect from applying our material. And so uh, it's those materials that help the plant go through physiological processes and changes. So as an example, if you're going from a vegetative growth stage to a reproductive growth stage, there's all sorts of things that are happening physiologically in the plant in terms of the nutrients that are required, the nutrient ratios, where those are being translocated in, in the plant, the structures that are being built. Uh, and those are all driven by hormones. So the plant, that's how it basically you know, determines where things are, are going to do and what, what they're going to do with them. So the repeated applications of our product with the Metagrow ST and the metabolites is it increases the efficiency of the plant making those physiological changes and directing things in the plant where they need to be. Microbes do that naturally over time. Uh, so if you have a product that doesn't have metabolites in it, so just you know, say a powdered uh, uh, set of bacteria or biology, uh, you'll put those on and if they do propagate in the soil over time, they're going to be doing those metabolites for you. But the idea of, of doing the repeated thing is you're, you're kind of giving that plant a little bit of a goose uh, periodically to help it be really, really efficient as it makes all these kinds of changes. Okay. Okay. Uh, th that's very, very helpful. If I'm setting up a new system, I'm giving Tyler a call and saying, Tyler, send me some grassroots fabric pots, buddy. I'm going to be doing some new living soil beds. It, what are the steps that I want to take to prepare those beds to be successful? How do I introduce life in the most efficient way? One thing I, I want to say real quickly before David takes off on this, because I'd love to hear his answer on it, is David's done all the brewing for you. We, we've, you know, it's a three-week process in building this population and getting it ready for its home. Its home is the soil. And um, if you're going to use our product in a compost tea, we would suggest probably adding it in a little bit towards the end and applying it immediately, or in the fact, just mixing our products together with some water and applying it immediately because these microbes are made to populate soil. They're not made to populate um, a brew tank. You know, we want to get them in the soil as soon as possible. And I think we see a lot of success or get them on the plant surface as soon as possible because microbes do survive on the leaf surface after the product does dry, which is very important to say. So when, you, when you're approaching developing, say, a, li a living soil, I think it's important to have a, a fundamental grasp on what your soil uh, chemistry and nutrient status is. So to start out with a soil test. Microbes can overcome a lot of imbalances in the soil and, and help a plant deal with that. But it's best if, if they're not having to overcome some fundamental problem. So 
uh, and there are certain, you know, there are certain things that the microbes can do for you. They, can, as an example, they can do the cytophore function on the cations and make those available for the plant. But if that element is not there in the soil, the microbe doesn't have anything to work with. So that's why a soil test at the beginning is like, oh, well, I have no iron in the soil, so it doesn't matter how good a job the microbes are doing, the plant's not going to get any iron. No fuel. So that that would be my first advice: is just have good soil chemistry and nutrient balance. And then the other thing is to inoculate uh, your soils early. Like right, if you're gonna reuse your soils, uh, do it post harvest and give the microbes a good feeding because they're gonna break down all those roots uh, that are, you know, the feeder roots that are left left in the beds. And those are great um, as long as you had a healthy, you know, good healthy crop. Uh, and time is your friend, you know, so giving the microbes a chance to build up their biology and get all those beneficial functions going in the soil and all those nutrients available. So when you transplant into that soil, that soil is ready to go. And then, you know, inoculating your transplants and then feeding the microbes, you know, to your plants, you know, weekly or biweekly uh, throughout the growing season. So that's that's kind of our approach to the, the living soils. Yeah, it would go into what we would call, we talked about a couple of times as a soil priming solution. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you talk about that for a second? Sure. Yeah. So that would just be um, different uh, different cultures of microbes. So Metagrow ST, uh, Tyler, Tyler mentioned the ST3, uh, and then giving it lots of food. So we do have two, uh, we have, actually have several different microbe food products, uh, and they, they complement the design of the populations of, of the microbe uh, products. So at Metagrow ST, uh, that's complemented by a wettable powder microbe food called M food or Metagrow M food. And that food is designed to be the maximum diversity uh, to propagate uh, as wildly a different uh, culture as, as possible. So it's got five different forms of proteins. Again, it's covering a, off a huge spectrum of uh, amino acids. This is, this is very similar to the ration that we feed the microbes for we're growing these populations. So it's very fine wettable powder, goes in solution really well, stays in suspension. Uh, and just a very small amount of food is enough to double your population. So as an example, a gallon of the microbe uh, population, you can feed a tenth of, to two tenths of a pound of the food. And that's enough food to actually double that population. And the, there are several things that, that are important about using the food with the microbes. There's a lot of products out there that are just, just microbes and they're, they're just like, put them on, that's it. Uh, that's really kind of, that's, that's shortchanging yourself a little bit where if, if you combine it with the food, uh, the microbes that are in stasis immediately wake up uh, upon exposure to the food. So within 15 minutes, half the population has already woken up because microbes are opportunists, they're not gonna miss out on a free meal. And what they'll do is they'll wake up and they'll attach themselves to the food. And so as you're as you're putting them on the plants, either through the irrigation system or drench or however you're, you're or foliar, applying it, those microbes land awake at, with food supply, habitat and shelter. And so that's enough, uh, you know, so that's why we have a, a very high colonization rate because they have everything that they need. And of course, as they consume that food, they're gonna produce more metabolites, which is part of what we're after. So we have the, the M food, which is designed for maximum diversity. And we have Metagro C food, which is what we combine with the ST3 that we've talked about. So the ST3 is the chitin oriented uh, metabolism, uh, micro population. So the, the Metagro C food is uh, the dominant protein is chitin. So those microbes are using their capability that we've turned on uh, to produce chitinase enzyme to break down that chitin. And so you break the chitin down into all these derivative chemical forms, many of which have some very, very beneficial uh, plant functions. And then we have uh, another, another, pump, uh, another uh, food product called Metagro V food. I'm very excited about V food. Uh, which, which is, it's the similar strategy to uh, M food, 
but we took the animal sourced products out of it. So V stands for vegan. Okay. So okay. it's a vegan food. You're breaking up just a little bit there, Tyler. I didn't quite hear what you said there. Uh, the V food uh, has uh, corn steep in it instead of fish hydrolysate. So okay. it's, uh, that makes it vegan, but it has a higher level of nitrogen in it. So if somebody, you know, was lacking nitrogen, they would want to move towards that product. A very good spectrum then of products across the board. Sounds like ready to not only feed the plant, but treat potential causes of concern, pests, diseases, that sort of thing. Treat them properly with healthy microbes as opposed to chemicals, which I'm a big fan of. The so. final powder we have is our Bloom product, um, which I've actually gravitated the most out of all of these um, because it helps facilitate that transition period in between veg and bloom and gives the plant everything it needs in that transition period. Um, and as an early foliar spray, also combined with our CFOS product, which is a phosphorus, um, you just have a tremendous, tremendous boost of immediate crystals, immediate crystal growth. And, and I think it's amazing when people are used to growing a strain and, and like two weeks into flower, or a week into flower, they get that crystal growth. Well, if you're using this stuff at the right times and giving the plant what it needs to make it efficient in these transition periods, you're gonna have that crystal growth way earlier. You're gonna have that smell way earlier. You're gonna have a better expression of your genetics because the plant worked a lot less harder to get there. I think that's a very important thing to, to say of genetic expression. How hard did the plant work to get there? And that's that's a great takeaway. And I've, I've heard that from other places is when the plant doesn't really have to do any work, it's just focusing then on building itself bigger, better and giving you that great end product that you strive for. Now, are there systems that wouldn't benefit from microbes if I'm doing hydroponics, for example, deep water culture? Oh, I think we'd be tremendously helpful in a lot of areas. Yeah, the, the one challenge that I've had in the hydro hydroponic context is they tend to use a lot of line cleaners uh, that, you know, they're looking to keep, make sure that their system just get fouled by uh, biofilm. Uh, and so they'll put on things like chlorine dioxide that's designed to kill all the microbes in your irrigation system. Well, of course, that goes through the tubes and lands on the growing media uh, and Decimates kills population. pretty much all the biology. So, yeah, you know, I, I had an interesting, uh, worked, worked with a very large greenhouse uh, tomato grower and had exactly that problem, but we still saw a substantial benefit in the growth of the plants because as the microbes died, they let loose of all these metabolites. And so we were, even though the microbes didn't survive in the, the wool, rock wool and, and the cocoa blocks uh, that they- it's a boost of food for the plants. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, you can yeah. really see some, as, as Tyler was alluding to, some genetic expression of a very, very happy plants. Very, very cool. So guys, I think we're getting close to the end of uh, our chat here. And I did have one more question. What are the biggest challenges in being a microbe farmer? Uh, being a farmer that uses microbes or or being a guy who raises microbes? Well, you know what? Give me a, give me a little context on both. Well, I think, I mean, the probably the more interesting uh, thing to talk about is the is the farmer, uh, you know, I oftentimes get asked the question is like, how, how long do I need to do this? If I do this for a year or two, am I good? Uh, do I need, do I really need to do this, you know, weekly or monthly or whatever the program is? And the answer is always, well, it depends on how many things you're doing in your cultural practices that are disadvantageous to the population. So, you know, if you aren't using your, you know, pesticides that affect the microbes or herbicides, you know, it's just, you know, anything that's typically systemic in the plant tends to be very detrimental to the microbes. Uh, and, you know, depending on your tillage, uh, cover cropping, solarization of the soil, even how much you irrigate and, and whether you, you have any, say, temporary anaerobic conditions that you create from irrigations. Uh, so these are all factors that you know, our practical things that we have to do as, as farmers, the really the guideline for us is to figure out how to 
reduce the severity of those negative effects on, on the biology uh, and, and do more beneficial things. And so a, as we do that, the population becomes more and more self-sustaining. And at, at that point, we just focus on additional diversity or timing uh, or you know, particular functions that we're really after. Let the soil do the work, let the microbes do the work, and you're gonna end up with those fantastic results. I'm sold. I mean, I've been for a while anyway, but, you know, it's it's really all about, uh, you know, using organics, that systems that's been in place for hundreds of millions of years. I mean, why try and reinvent things? Guys, been a fantastic conversation today and really happy to have you on. If I want to find uh, concentrated biology products, how do I go about doing so? Uh, grassrootsfabricpots.com. If you hit the shop link at the top, you're going to see concentrated biology. Um, right now we're offering it 25% off as well. So you've got some huge discounts on the whole product line. Um, we've got one, the, the powders typically come in a one pound um, bag. Um, the Metagrow ST comes in a 2.5 gallon jug as a retail price of $71 before the 25% discount. Uh, so if you look at that at a per gallon price compared to what you're getting from other uh, products, um, it's, it's quite amazing, honestly, the value that you get um, especially with how diverse it is and, and how much potency you get in those products. Um, so one pound bags or 2.5 gallon jugs. Uh, we've got all the products in stock and ready to move at any time. Uh, we also have uh, the sea crop product, which is an ocean mineral product that is mainly magnesium, but it's got about 98% of the periodical chart of elements in it. Um, that's a pretty cool one. And also our fix our product, which is um, a yucca extract for foliar spraying microbes. So it's a beneficial food and it also helps stick the microbes to the plant. Yep. And, yeah. you know, like, like we said, we're trying to give all the microbes everything they need. So when they hit the leaf surface or they hit the soil, they can survive. It's kind of like sending a whole bunch of troops into, into war. They have a backpack full of food and ammo and everything they need and a medical pack to take care of it and to survive, to get through that three or four day trek that they've got to do, serve their, their purpose. So that's what we're trying to do as well is give them everything they need and in the plant what it needs. Awesome. Awesome. And one more, if somebody wants to follow up and has a few questions, do they just reach out to you guys at Grassroots Fab and Pots? What's the best way? Yeah, I'd definitely say uh, go onto the website and fill out a job form, just a request, because um, then I can reach out to you whether whatever way you prefer, whether that's phone, email, or however that works. Um, I also run the Grassroots Instagram, so you can DM us through Grassroots there. Uh, Concentrated Biology has its own Instagram page with 500 followers, um, so please go follow the Concentrated Biology. And um, eventually, we're definitely going to get our, um, our licensing and approval for the Canadian market and be up there eventually. We would love to, love to be able to service that market as well very soon. Stellar. Well, hopefully that happens sooner than later, because after talking all about this stuff, guys, I would really love to give the product a shot. But that being said, eh, the borders are the borders. Gentlemen, absolutely appreciate your time. Thank you so much for stopping by today. Guys, go check out Concentrated Biology. Sounds like it would be fantastic in your garden. Awesome. All right, we're out. <laughs>